Hello friends. Today we will see the second part of general pathology of homeopathy. Here we will see what is the evolution of the disease. So we all know that the disease is on a dynamic level and it is never a materialistic uh, aspect whereby we have to look it at the at at from the disease point of view so the old school looks at the disease at the materialistic level whereas the homeopathic school looks at the disease at the dynamic level you see friends we all know that life is not a straight line it is always static that means it has or it moves in a flow it is it is always in a flow and it is never and it and it doesn't stop it just moves on and on and on until the patient until the person dies so similarly here the dynamic energy also is never static it goes on moving goes on moving goes on moving in an in division so here initially when the vital force is deranged at the dynamic level it becomes very difficult for the homeopathic physician to identify the disease condition or what is wrong with the patient however in the olden days there were people who were known as dowsers and a person who is a dowser he uses the method of dowsing also known as radiesthesia out here the person has some powers within him whereby if whereby he can identify that if you dig at this point in the soil you will get water and if you dig at that place in the soil you will get oil so a dowser is able to identify by the method of dowsing whether oil or water is present below the soil so it is done by a pen a small pendulum is taken attached to a string or a chain and you get a dowsing chart so if the patient is not there you can also have a photograph of the patient give it to the dowser he will keep it on the table in front of the chart he'll hold the pendulum on top on top of the patient's photograph and he will talk to the pendulum saying that this person mr x y z please tell me what is wrong with the patient and the pendulum is kept in the center of the dowsing chart and his hand is kept at a i mean his hand is not moving and it is very steady at one point only or at one place only then the pendulum will go on moving in in a clockwise or an anti clockwise direction and it will stop at one point in time at, at the chart then the dowser will be able to tell you that something is wrong with the patient's respiratory system or the thorax and you have to identify later on go to a doctor and identify later on by investigations what exactly is wrong with the patient so the dowser will be able to identify the location or the area of the disease which the patient is having another method is also known as the psychometer it was invented by carl jung in 1906 so a psychometer is a device which is used for measuring the mental or the psychological activity so in the olden days there was a meter known as the psychometer and it and it could measure the mental activity of the person as well as or the psychological activity of the patient it can also be defined as a person supposedly able to deduce facts about the events by touching objects rela relating to them so if something is wrong with the patient the person will put his hand on the on the person's head and by doing so he will be able to tell you what is wrong with the patient okay so this was in the olden days as science progressed further now these are all out fashion or they are not seen nowadays then the disease from the dynamic level will go to the post dynamic level or the pre clinical or the pre functional level 
From there, it goes to the functional level. And from there, it will go to the structural level. So now let us see some details about it. So homeostasis is maintained in the body by the harmonious functioning of the psycho neuroendocrine system that is the PNE axis and the reticuloendothelial system that is the RES. The vital force balances the internal milieu of the whole body so that the health is maintained. The vital force works in harmony with the internal as well as external environment of the body. So the internal environment is the all the different processes going on in our body unconsciously like digestion, respiration, assimilation, anabolism, catabolism, etc. And the external environment is the physical causes, the chemical causes, the biological causes, and the psychosocial cultural causes. So the vital force, it works or maintains harmony both with the external environment as well as the internal environment. So it maintains all the normal physiological processes of the body in good working condition and protects the body from the external inimical influences. So what happens initially when the body is subjected to the external environment? The body initially will try to resist the noxious inimical influences which are there in the external, external environment. Later on, the vital force cannot adapt to these constant inimical changes and it gets weakened. Naturally, if something is bombarding the vital force again and again, time to time, then naturally, initially, what will happen? The vital force will resist it. But if the same stimulus is applied to the vital force again and again, then the vital force gets weakened. And what happens? There is a failure of adaptation, which results in a disease state. So this is a very important point to note that why does a disease occur in an individual? Or why does the vital force gets deranged? It gets deranged because of the failure to adapt to the circumstances or to the environment. Okay, it's like a rubber band. You take a rubber band and you go on stretching it. And a point in time will come where it will snap and it will break into two pieces. So why does this occur? Initially, when you push, when you stretch the rubber band, what happens? The elasticity is there, so you will be able to stretch it. But when the elasticity no more can be stretched, there is a failure. And what happens? The rubber band snaps. And so this can be compared to the health state when the rubber band is being stretched and the inimical influences are acting on it. The vital force is strong enough to ward away the external inimical influences. But what happens later on when the vital force gets weakened and the inimical influences are, are still bombarding the vital force, there is a failure of adaptation. So therefore the rubber band snaps, there's a loss of elasticity. The threshold of elasticity cannot be still pulled or the threshold is, uh, is um, is overcome or, or, or and the rubber band snaps so therefore in a in a human being when there is a failure of adaptation the disease state will stay set inside so the first signs of the deranged vital force cannot be seen as it is dynamic in nature so initially just when the vital force is just being deranged Hardly any signs are there or symptoms are there, except the patient may feel when he gets up in the morning, oh, today I'm not feeling well. That's all. You see, so this is known as the preclinical or the pre-functional stage. Here, it becomes difficult for the physician to ascertain the signs and symptoms. Why? Because there are hardly any symptoms. However, the initial dynamic derangement can be made known to the physician by special techniques, which I've told you, which are known as dowsing or radiesthesia. And also one extra point I would like to add here is in today's 21st century, it is known as the Krillian photography or the aura, or in the most modern terms, it is known as the aura scan. So Krillian photography in, in itself, it's a different topic. We will not go into the details of it, but out here, 
a photograph of your fingerprints of your upper and the low extremities of your fingers and your toes are taken on a photographic paper <coughs> excuse me and it is developed and you get a pattern this pattern could be toxic it could be degenerative or it could be just an ordinary deficiency pattern so each part of your finger will represent certain parts of the body so it depends on where the energy is either is either deficient or toxic you can identify what is wrong with the patient's location part or area involved so this is known as the krillian photography or in modern terms is the aura scan out here they scan your whole body and the different chakras are there in the body so they'll tell you in which chakra the energy is blocked and and by knowing so you can be more conversant with what is wrong with you so now as the disordered function of the vital faults progresses or it gets deranged more and more naturally more and more it gets deranged the signs and symptoms will now appear now this is known as the functional or the prodromal stage so here the normal physiological function of the body is altered giving rise to the signs and symptoms so out here you will definitely get some signs and symptoms some of them could be characteristic some of them could be common but out here you will definitely get some signs and symptoms whereby you may i repeat you may be able to prescribe on well this stage of the prodromal level is also known as an indisposition dr kent says indisposition is nothing but mimicking diseases this may be primarily either a somatic disease or primarily a psychic disease so the reference in organon book for a somatic disease is is aphorism number 4 and for a psychic disease aphorism number 224 to 226 so therefore indispositions are generally acute and they are known as improperly improperly called chronic diseases aphorism number 77 Seven or why are they known as a inappropriate or improperly known chronic diseases? Because they mimic the true chronic disease. So you may mistake an indisposition for a true chronic disease. So let us see what is the basic differentiating point of an indisposition and a true chronic disease. In an indisposition, the cause is always external. in a true chronic disease the cause is always internal in an indisposition if you remove the external cause health is maintained in an indisposition in an true chronic disease there is no external cause to be removed the internal cause has to be mitigated the internal cause out here is the miasms which are responsible for the different expressions thrown out by the patient so this is the basic difference you all must know and in this phase if you do some investigations the biochemical investigations will come out to be normal as the disease further progresses due to the further derangement of the vital force more and more signs and symptoms will appear now the disease from the functional level will go on to the structural level or the structural change whereby you can definitely come to know what is wrong with the patient because the symptoms are quite prominent and they are characteristic in nature and the biochemical investigations will be abnormal so by taking the history of the patient taking the expressions of the patient that is the totality of the symptoms and the investigations combining all these three you can come to a definite diagnosis what is wrong with the patient as well as all the symptom all the investigations what you've done few of them may be abnormal which will help you to strike the correct diagnosis 
once the diagnosis is made you will come to know what is the pathology behind the disease whether it is a reversible pathology or whether it is an irreversible pathology so therefore to sum it up the disease will travel from the prefunctional to the functional to the structural plane and all these stages can be equated with the three miasms of sora psychosis and syphilis so the functional level can be associated with the soric miasm then the structural changes can be associated with the psychotic miasm or soro psychotic miasm and the structural changes which are irreversible have to be they will come under the syphilitic miasm so different expressions will tell you at what level the miasmatic influence is acting on the patient so what does pathology in homeopathy mean so the importance is given to the cause of the disease out here in the cause of the disease the most important cause is the ailments from if you can if you can identify or if if there is a positive relation between the causative factor and the expression of the disease you will be able to choose the remedy in an easier much more easier fashion for example patient has come to you with decreased memory he has difficulty in memorizing his school work and there is confusion of thoughts and there is drowsiness and he cannot concentrate on his studies and his grades in class are falling so then you inquire into the history and you find out that a few months back he was climbing a tree and that student fell down from the tree on the head was admitted to the hospital ct scan was done and luckily everything was normal there wasn't any problem he was kept under observation for 2 to 3 days in the hospital and then was discharged so you get it out here you've got a definite relationship that and the parents will tell you that only after this incident of this fall from a tree which his head was involved or he got a head injury all these complaints have started only after that okay so out here there's a different relation to the ailments form or for the cause of the disease to the expression so important three mark remedies in the repertory if you see ailments from head injury or head injury remote effect of will be natrum sulf arnica and pulsatilla so in this case this is just an example i'm telling you you have you have to take a full case and have to identify the correct remedy so in this case ailments from bad effects of head injury will be natrum sulf so you can give natrum natrum sulf to the patient so this method can be used if the cause is very very prominent secondly you have to also identify the expressions and see which expressions fall under which miasma so a patient will come to you at a point in time not necessarily in the beginning of the disease that is the soric miasma he may come to you in the middle of the disease that is the psychotic miasma for example take example of pain in the knee joint he comes to your clinic where the right knee joint is swollen if you touch it there's increased temperature there's inflammation restriction of movements and there is pain x-ray finding shows minimum reduction of the of the joint spaces and soft tissue swelling so out here you come to know that the patient is in a psychotic phase because of induration inflammation leading to induration leading to stasis leading to soft tissue engorgement or touch of soft tissue swelling so you know that you are in the psychotic phase from the x ray you also know that there is no great pathology it is a reversible pathology so you take the symptoms according to lsmc form prescribe for the patient and if you are correct with the remedy then what will happen 
all improvement will take place and the patient will be able to move the knee joint there won't be any restriction of movements the inflammation will subside the soft tissue swelling will subside and the patient now will be quite better so you know after giving your medicine now you are in the soric phase so you have reversed the phase from a psychotic to the soric phase in this case this was a reversible case so it was all right if it was an irreversible case if you are at that syphilitic uh, if the patient has come to you at a point in time where the syphilitic miasm is predominant then the remedy will only help to elevate the sufferings of the patient it will not be able to cure the patient it will just help to temporarily give some relief to the patient so in such cases you 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 can palliate so the hanimanian pathology is nothing but the miasms which it has to be equated to so different pathologies can be equated to different miasms we shall see that as we move further now what's the scope of pathology in homeopathy so or rather why is it important so pathology helps in the clinical diagnosis of the disease it helps to identify the hanimanian pathology or the miasms it helps to identify the phenomena of suppression and it helps to determine the prognosis of the disease it helps in the assessment of susceptibility helps to determine the remedy re reaction or response helps to determine the homeopathic pathology as well as it helps as an index to select the correct remedy it also helps us to individualize the case to find out or decipher the oxyliner treatment to determine the genus epidemicus in an epidemic case and also to determine the prophylactic remedy in an epidemic case or otherwise and it helps to determine the diet and regimen required for it so let us di discuss the first point pathology helps in the clinical diagnosis of disease so out here you see in your clinic most of the times you will find out that patients come to us with a big fat file of all the investigations done so out here the clinical diagnosis has already been made by the modern medicine doctor and the patient has gone from one doctor to the other doctor of modern medicine because the patient has not got much relief from the complaints for example let us take a case of bronchial asthma patient comes with a case of bronchial asthma he goes from one doctor to the other doctor each time the doctor changes the prescription and he is not completely all right the asthma attack still come he is still distressed his quality of life is poor and he cannot do his routine work properly so he comes to a homeopathic doctor as you all know you see they go to all other doctors and ultimately they come to the homeopathic doctor to get some relief so out here you have to take the full case as per the instructions given in the organon textbook 83 to 104 in which he has given how to take an which dr hanneman has given how to take an acute case a chronic case and an epidemic case what are the do's and don'ts etc etc which is all given in the organon textbook so initially you have to take all the patient all the symptoms of the patient in the very words as told by the patient and you must listen you must see and you must write down all the all what the patient wants to tell you in his in his in his very words and after the patient is telling you finish telling you all what he has all what he wanted to tell you about the disease the physician will go through each symptom one by one and elicit more special or precise information after the physician is satisfied with the history he will then analyze the case and convert the chief complaints of the patient into a tabular form of location sensation modalities and concomitants and the pathology so the first column will be location then sensation then modalities of any concomitants are there that will be the fourth column and the pathology will be written under the location so now let us see some examples example of pneumonia and renal failure so the homeopathy physician must be conversant with the uh, with the different stages of pneumonia and what occurs in the stages of pneumonia the macroscopic structure and the microscopic changes also so let us see pneumonia consists of four stages congestion red hepatization gray hepatization and resolution so you must know that 
The stage of congestion occurs within the first 24 hours of contracting pneumonia. Red hepatization occurs two to three days after the congestion stage. Gray hepatization will occur two to three days after the red hepatization. And resolution will take place up between 10 to 21 days. So in congestion, it, as I told you, it occurs within the first 24 hours of contracting pneumonia. During congestion, the body will experience vascular engorgement, intraavialy fluid, and multiple bacteria. The lungs will be very heavy and red. Capillaries in the alveoli walls become congested, and the infection spread to the hilum and pleura. During this stage, a person will experience coughing and deep breathing. Red hepatization, it occurs two to three days after congestion. At this point, the lung will be red, firm, and airless, and will resemble to that of the liver. Avioli capillaries will be engorged with blood and vascular congestion will persist. And during the red hepatization stage, the avioli will contain many erythrocytes, neutrophils, desquamate epithelial cells and fibrin. In the gray hepatization phase, this stage occurs two to three days after the red hepatization and is in an avascular stage. The lungs will appear to be a greenish, grayish brown or yellow color because of the disintegration of the red cells. And your lungs will appear to be paler and drier than usual. There will be persistence of fibrin exudate during this stage. In resolution or complete recovery occurs when the exudate experiences progressive enzymatic digestion. This will produce debris that is eventually reabsorbed, ingested by macrophages, coughed up or reorganized by fibroblasts. It takes an average 20, 10 to 21 days. So out here in all these stages, or rather all these stages can be equated with the myosin. So this we'll see later on as we, as we go ahead. That is why this is the importance to know the pathology behind it because you have to equate it with the myosin. Now chronic kidney, kidney disease, what are the pathological changes associated with it? They are glomerulosclerosis and tubulo interstitial fibrosis. There's a result Excuse me. There's a result in loss of normal renal architecture, microvascular, capillary, rarefraction, hypoxia, and tubular and tubular atrophy. So there are five stages of kidney diseases. Stage one with a normal or high GFR, as you can see in the brackets. Stage two with a mild CKD. Stage three with moderate CKD. So in this also stage, you must know in which stage the patient is coming to you and, and how you'll be able to help the patient. Second point is pathology helps to identify the Hanemanian pathology or the myosin. Now the Hanemanian pathology is nothing but it is, it is the reference to the myosin. So Hanemanian pathology has to be equated with the myosins. So as you all know, myosin is the cause of all acute and chronic diseases. So for an acute disease, the acute myosin is responsible. For a chronic disease, the chronic myosin is responsible. Even for an acute disease, the exciting cause is responsible for the aggravation of the disease. And in the chronic disease, the precipitating cause or the maintaining cause is also responsible for the aggravation of the disease. So therefore, general pathology can be applied to every part, organ or system of the body. So whatever the location or whatever is the part or organ or system involved, you have to identify the pathology which has to be identified or which can be equated with the myosins. Or the disease may travel from the skin to the mucous membrane to the serous membranes and the more vital organs. That also you have to see the direction of the disease and it will also tell you about the pathology of the same. So location will tell you about the pathology that is the part area system involved. That is in the first column. When you analyze the case, the first column will be, for example, bronchial asthma, location will be the respiratory system. The myosmetic interpretation will tell us about the pathology. So whatever expressions the patient is telling you, these expressions can be also converted into the miasmatic background. Okay, for example, 
let me just give you one example of bronchial asthma. Bronchial asthma per se, as the disease diagnosis, it we generally say it is psychotic. If we just take into consideration the name of the disease, bronchial asthma. Why is it psychotic? Because there is vasoconstriction of the bronchi and the bronchioles, and there is difficulty in breathing. There is increase of fluid in the alveoli space as a result of which there is a difficulty in breathing and cough takes place with expectoration, initially white, later on superadded with bacteria when it, when it is infected and it may be either yellow or green expectoration. So initially when the bronchial asthma starts, no, so initially in this case, what are we having? We are having vasoconstriction, congestion, stagnation, accumulation of fluid in the alveoles, and presence of cough with initially a transparent expectoration, then it goes to a yellowish green expectoration. So out here, the hallmark feature is vasoconstriction with accumulation of fluid. So therefore, the diagnosis the miasmatic diagnosis of bronchial asthma, just by looking or just by taking into consideration the diagnostic aspect of the disease, we say it is psychotic in nature. But now if we dissect the disease of bronchial asthma into the various stages, then we'll have different miasmatic evaluation. For example, before the asthma attack starts, the patient has an asthmatic aura. He knows that the attack will come. Why? Because he gets an irritative cough or he will sneeze a few times and then he'll come to know now my, now my asthma attack will start. So initially, the asthmatic aura, when it starts like an irritative cough or in sneezing, that will be directly, that will be directly psychotic in, sorry, soric in nature. And then later on, when the asthma attack starts, the difficulty in breathing, he sits up in bed in the middle of the night or whenever, and he wants the open air or, or, or what are symptoms are there. So this attack and there is a wheezing in the chest. This phase is a psychotic phase. Now, if this phase, if not treated properly, either by the modern medicine or by homeopathy, and if it prolongs, it will go into the syphilitic phase whereby you get an irreversible lung damage occurring. So COPD is nothing but one of the COPDs is bronchial asthma, which falls under this classification. So the patient is irregular with treatment, not taking proper treatment, or the physician is not giving proper treatment or inadequate treatment, or the patient ignores his health, then he may go into the syphilitic phase. So out here you see, now how does it differ? The miasm from the disease of bronchial asthma is psychotic, but once you dissect it, into the different phases, the miasms also, they will differ. So, so now give me example, I'll tell you exam, exam, simple example of inflammation. Now inflammation, initially it is soric. Then when inflammation leads to induration, it is psychotic. When induration leads to suppuration with formation of sinus and fistula or pus formation or suppuration, this sinus and fistula may either heal up or they may not heal up or they may heal up, again break open, again heal up, again break open. So this separation, sinus fistula, separation tendency with healing or not healing or breaking up, not healing up, it is a tubercular activity. So it shows you the, the activity of the tubercular myosin. Or directly there's a formation of an ulcer which heals by formation of a scar tissue and subsequently a keloid formation. So ulceration, again, is syphilitic myism and the scar tissue also. So a scar tissue, uh, if it is disfigured, it will be an syphilitic scar. Otherwise, a keloid is generally an psychotic manifestation. It is a hypertrophy of a scar. So hypertrophy, again, it falls into the psychotic myism. So therefore, it is psychotic. So thus, in any of the stages, the remedy will differ. So if the stage is different, the myosin is different, naturally the remedies also will be different. So inflammation which comes and goes is soric or the first stage of inflammation we see, it is soric. 
induration is psychotic, suppuration sinus fistula is tubercular, ulcer is syphilitic, keloid is psychotic. Thus, the understanding of theory of disease and its myospathic interpretation is very important. So therefore, you must understand the theory of chronic disease that initially in Dr. Hanneman's practice, when he was practicing homeopathy, he was quite happy with the cures, but later on he found out that the same patients came back with the same complaints. So he went on thinking why this occurred and he found out the cause to be, to be because the totality of the symptoms weren't taken properly or there were certain aspects which were ignored in the totality of the symptoms or there was some obstacle, the persistence and non-eradication of which gave rise to the disease to come back. So he identified this as the three great miasms of sora, syphilis, and psychosis. So once he identified the miasm was an obstacle to the patient's re reoccurrence of the disease, then Dr. Hanneman classified all the drugs which he has proved that is totally 99 in his lifetime under anti-psychotic, anti-soric, and anti-syphilitic remedies. So depending upon the miasm, the remedy has to be given. So therefore, this is also important to understand the theory of chronic disease and its miasmatic interpretation. So let us see now what is the importance of pathology to a homeopath. So the pathology, as, as I told you, has to be equated with the miasm. So once you come to know the miasm, it will help you in the treatment. So, so it will help you to know which, miasm, which remedy to select or which anti-miasmatic remedy to select. And not only that, it helps us to identify the miasm. So if a soric miasm is there, you know that it is a reversible condition. You know that the cure will take place fast and the pathology is just functional in nature. If it's a syphilitic miasm, you know that the pathology is irreversible and that you cannot cure the, and you cannot cure the disease. So therefore, you know that you'll be only able to palliate it. So therefore, once you identify the miasms and you identify the symptoms of the miasms and the pathology, then you'll be able to come to a conclusion whether the disease is in a stage of curability or it is a stage of incurability. So those diseases which are curable can be cured with homeopathy and those diseases which are incurable, at the most you can give palliation to them. It also helps us to identify the individual. That means what? It helps us to individualize the case. I'll give you an example of this knee joints, pain and swelling. So if two pa patients come to you with the same complaints of knee joint or right knee joint swelling, the symptoms will be different or the symptoms may be the same, pain, stiffness, but the, but the type of pain could be different from both these people. The modalities could be different. Therefore, the remedy also differs. So therefore, though the diagnosis of both these patients are the same, or the complaints of the patient are the same, the remedy given is different. Why? Because we have individualized the patient according to homeopathy. Therefore, we say that homeopathy is a super speciality because it is the only speciality which, will, which individualizes the case. And it also helps us in the acquisition of the homeopathic pathology. So once you come to know the miasm or once you come to know the curability or incurability of the case, you'll be able to identify what potency to give the medicine in. So for example, if the patient has a soric miasm, the expressions are characteristic and the case is naturally curable, then you can give an high potency. Whereas if a case has a syphilitic miasm, it has a few characteristic symptoms and the susceptibility is quite moderate or low to moderate and the pathology is irreversible, you know that this is an incurable case. So in such cases, you always start with the low potency and then later on step up the potency once the susceptibility has increased from low to high or the patient has responded well with low potency naturally the susceptibility which was low will slowly slowly rise. So if there's a beneficial action of the medicine 
with the 30th potency then maybe you can go later on to the 200th potency and so on and so forth but in a pathological case always start with a 30th potency with infrequent repetition otherwise if you give a high potency with frequent repetition or high potency even with infrequent repetition you may get an killer's aggravation that is in an incurable case as per kent's first observation prolonged aggravation with final decline in health of the patient so this has to be kept in mind with the hanimen in pathology so now what to look for in a case so basically we have to perceive the evolution of the progress of the disease through the odp of the presenting of the chief complaint so we have to identify or we have to take into consideration the important events of the odp how did the disease start how long does it how how long has it lasted what was the direction of the disease and what was the presenting complaints or the or what symptoms were or what symptoms are exhibited and at present what is the state of progress of the disease so by knowing the important evolutionary march of events you will identify the miasmatic shift also or you be able to perceive the miasms and the shift of the miasms also if you take the case correctly with the correct evolutionary sequence of the march of events taking place in a patient's life then not only that you also have to recognize the intensity the speed the depth the direction the type of character symptoms and immunity of the case so this can be easily identified by identifying the miasm so once you identify the miasm for example in the soric miasm the speed is quite fast in the syphilitic miasm the speed may be slow or fast psychotic miasm the speed is always very very insidious or very very slow the depth of the disease in soric miasm it is superficial in psychotic miasm it is a bit more than superficial you can say and in syphilitic miasm it is very deep the direction of the disease is also important whether it is going in the right direction or whether it is going in the wrong direction of the herring's law of cure that also has to be kept in mind and the types of symptoms which are there whether they are common symptoms or whether they are characteristic symptoms if they are characteristic symptoms what are the what is the what is the grade of these symptoms that also has to be kept into mind and naturally the immunity of the case so by doing all this we can identify the miasmatic cleavage of the case so a case can be simple by having only one miasm so if one miasm is there it is simple to treat that will also depend upon the type of miasm which is present suppose soric miasm is present you all know that it has functional disturbances simple to treat there are characteristic symptoms and it is simple to identify the simidema and the patient will get all right soon provided your medicine is correct and if you go to the uh, syphilitic miasm you know that there's a reversible change the symptoms few of them may be characteristic but but most symptoms are common and it is an irreversible case the pathology is very deep you know that in such cases you will not be able to cure the patient but will will you be able to only palliate the patient so therefore by doing so we can have an important look into the pathology which will help us to identify the miasm which will help us to identify the curability or incurability of the case and also it will help us to identify what potency to give the medicine in 